Well, good evening. Welcome to our uh, Bible study here at Gateway Church. And uh, I'm just going to share a psalm with you. We're going to look at Psalm 100. And it says this. Shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever. And his faithfulness continues to each generation. And there at the start it says, Worship the Lord with gladness. And that's what we're going to do this evening. We're going to spend some time before Frankie comes and shares a word with us. We're going to take some time to worship our God. And so, if you want to stand wherever you are, you can stand at home as well if you like. Get into a place where you can give God praise. And we thank you that you're here with us tonight, Lord. You're ready to be with us. You're ready to do something amazing. We open up our hearts, Lord, to receive amazing gift of your love. And we thank you that, yes, we have experienced it. We want more of your love tonight, God. We want to experience deeper depths, Lord, of all you want to reveal to us. Help us to be open-hearted, to, to receive from you.
mountains will move every chain on the past. You broke it into all oh, the Roman lights and singing the truth. And nothing is impossible. Every giant will fall. The mountains will move every chain of the past. You broke it.
It's only bad for us, God, to, to worship you and to give you praise, to give you glory and honor. It's only bad for us to, to let that pour out, to let that overflow out of us. We just thank you for the opportunity tonight, God, just to express our hearts to you, so. As we continue through this evening, help us to just stay in that place, Lord, of adoration. Help us stay in that place of worship. Stay in that place of thankfulness to you. Because we know that you have saved us. And we know that you have got great plans for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Excuse me, back. I'm oh, sorry. I just think we've got a, a word of encouragement um, for somebody. Um, we were singing uh, a minute ago. Every chain of the past you've broken in two. And I was reminded when I was preaching on Sunday talks about the Midianites and everybody came in like as thick as locusts they came into the into the land and with the, in height with that that line I just felt God was saying to all of us but maybe somebody in particular um, that he is the God who restores the earth that the locusts has eaten he is the God who can restore everything no matter what you faced in the past um, and he can bring it out because he is the redeemer of all things amen to Frank and now to share the word with us. last words. So tonight I am going to be talking about some of the last words that Jesus spoke. And it was a hard decision to sort of think, well, where do I start uh, with famous last words? Because as you go through the Bible, there's actually quite a lot of really, really good words. But I was drawn to Jesus, some of Jesus' very last words that he gave in the canon of Scripture. So we're going to be uh, in Revelation tonight. Oh, yes. Uh, Revelation is a great book. Uh, it's, 
promises a blessing to everybody who reads it and hears it and does the things that are written in it. So we're all going to be blessed tonight. Um, and in Revelation 1, John is taken in the spirit to um, this, well, he's taken in the spirit, he's taken to heaven, but he sees this amazing vision of Jesus. And it's a wonderful chapter because we see Jesus in all of his majesty, in all of his splendor, as the risen king in his priestly garments. And he says to John, you are going to write down these things and you're going to be my secretary, basically. And John is tasked with writing down the apocalypse, which contrary to Hollywood's definition, actually means the unveiling and the revealing, not uh, the end of the world, although it is the end of the world, as we know, but the word means unveiling or revealing. So it is the revelation, because it's the apocalypse, the uh, unveiling. And Jesus had some things that he wanted to uh, impart to his church, and he chose John to write it down. And in Revelation 1, verse 19, it gives an overview of what the book is about. So it says in uh, verse 19, write the things you have seen, the things that are, and the things that are to take place hereafter. So we have the things that John saw, which is basically everything in chapter one. We have the things that are, which is chapter two and chapter three, which is the churches. That's the now, that's Pentecost to the end of the church age. And then we have the things which will be, which is basically chapter four onwards. And we get to see the rapture, we get to see the tribulation, we get to see the millennium, and we get to see the uh, new heaven and the new earth. But tonight I want to talk about the things that are the churches, because that's where we are now. And chapters two and three are a personal dictation to John by Jesus of things that he wants to tell his church. And each letter to the church is a whole teaching on itself. So I'm not going to go through them all because we would be here till midnight. So we're going to go through them briefly, but I want to draw some things out of them that will help us to move forward as a church and individually, which dovetails pretty well with what we were on about last month, moving forward, which is unintentional. But Jesus dictates these words personally. So these are all the words of Jesus, and he chooses seven churches to address seven letters to. Now these churches are not arbitrarily assigned, they're very significant. They apply in, the, in that time to those seven churches. They apply prophetically across the ages of all the church, in, the church history. And they apply topically right here to us, you and me, all the believers in 2021 right now. So there's three applications to these letters. And if we looked on a map and we had a look at where these churches are, you'd see that they are now what we call modern day Turkey. They were in Asia Minor then, it was under the Roman Empire. And um, if you look at them on the map, they're sort of in a circular pattern on, on, on a map. And everything in the letters to these churches is significant. The name of the church, every word that's given in the letter is significant. And each one is a very, has a very distinct pattern. It's addressed to the ecclesia, to the church. And we, what we need to get away from when we think of these letters and when we're reading these is we need to get away from this. We need to get away from the building because we kind of put church into little buildings, into this church here and that church there and that church down the road and that one does that does this and that one that believes that. But when Jesus uses the word ecclesia, he means his whole assembly of believers, his whole body of believers. So we just need to get out of the mindset of a building of believers because he's talking to all of his believers and there's a very distinct pattern through the letters so jesus introduces the church by name he introduces himself and the way he in introduces himself is very specific to that particular church and what's happening in that church he then gives the church and a little mini appraisal and he tells them what they're doing well if they're doing anything well what they're not doing so well and he asks them to repent 
He tells them the consequences if they don't repent. And then he gives a promise to everybody who overcomes. So his famous last words in every single one of the letters is to him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches with a promise to the overcomers. And if you're any good at maths, you'll realise that he says this seven times within these two chapters. So because he repeats this so many times, I think that we, we're duty bound to study what Jesus wants to say to us. He tells us to listen and he tells us to overcome repeatedly. So every letter ends with this specific promise to the overcomer and those words, to him who has an ear, let him hear. And that is a command in the Greek, it's in the imperative, so it's a command. What the Spirit says in the Greek, that is in the present tense. So if I was to put it into Frankie style, like I like to do sometimes, just to make sure I'm understanding everything properly, I would translate it to the one having an ear, hear what the Spirit is now saying to the assemblies. This is for right now, because it's in the present tense. And all these letters that John wrote in Revelation weren't just going to that specific church, the whole thing was going to each church. So the ones that were doing really good got to see about the ones that were doing really bad, and the ones that were doing really bad got to see about the ones that were doing really good, so they can learn from each other. So, but they're for the whole assembly. And the seven churches, and seven is quite a significant number um, in the Bible, it's a number of spiritual completeness. So these seven churches represent the complete spiritual um, assembly of believers all up through the ages. So as we go through, I'd ask us to remember that Jesus is for us. He's absolutely for us. He wants us to run the race. He wants us to finish well. He wants us to overcome. He absolutely wants us to be overcomers. And so much so that he's made a promise of a reward to those who overcome. Now, when I read this and I go through these, I think, well, if he's promising things to those who overcome, to me, it kind of think, well, some people might not overcome. But we're not going to be those people. We are going to be overcomers. Um, but we need to know exactly what an overcomer is before we can start sort of digging into it. So the Greek word uh, for overcome is nikeo. It means to conquer and to be victorious. So what do we need to overcome? What do we need to conquer? Because the Bible says that Jesus has overcome the world and that we're more than conquerors through him. And positionally in Christ, we are. We are more than conquerors. Christ has overcome the world and we are in Christ. So positionally with Christ, we are more than conquerors. But experientially, we can be overcome by our circumstances, by sin, by the devil, by the flesh. So sometimes we can succumb to these things and we can be overcome by our circumstances experientially. But positionally, we're always overcomers in Christ. But Jesus wants us to walk in that experience of being an overcomer. He wants us to live out the word of God by renewing our mind, by walking in faith, by walking in love, and by being obedient to the Holy Spirit. So when we think of, well, what does that look like? We might think of, well, the world might say an overcomer is somebody who has no problems, who just has a rosy life with no problems and they're just like this all the time when actually that's not quite what Jesus sees an overcomer as. And as we go through, we'll see this. But, you know, we have our ups and downs. We can go through very many different circumstances. We can go through tough times and good times, but we can still be an overcomer because being an overcomer is not the absence of troubles in our life. Yeah. It's walking through them with Jesus, displaying the behaviours, displaying the works that are pleasing to him. It's living that exchange life, him living through us. That's what Jesus sees being an overcomer's like, and we're going to see this. So now we have an idea of what being an overcomer is, and that's, as I said, kind of a running theme through each of these letters, and he ends these letters with these words. 
we need to dig into it. That was just my introduction, so buckle up, we're going on a <laughs> quite a journey. I am going to go through them very, very quickly, so don't worry. So our first church is Ephesus in chapter 2 um, and verse 1. Now Ephesus, depending on what Bible dictionary you look in, um, some of them say it means new town, but most scholar, Bible scholars um, would agree that it means desirable or beloved. So this church is called the Beloved. And we know this church from Paul's letters because he wrote a letter to them and quite a lot happened at Ephesus. And Jesus is really, really pleased with their work. In fact, when I counted up how many things Jesus was pleased with, there was nine, nine things? I think there was nine things that Jesus was pleased with. And I thought, well, if Jesus was pleased with nine things that I was doing, I'd be really chuffed. Um, he says, I'm pleased with your works, and he mentions things like their, uh, their faith and their hard work and their patience. Um, but then he says in verse 4, nevertheless. Now we never want to hear a nevertheless from Jesus, but he does say, nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. So these, this church was the apostolic church if you're looking through the church through the ages on a prophetic timeline, this was a church that was building church, planting church. They did have persecution, built on the apostles' work, and yet they were doing so much good, and they were doing so much kingdom work, but they neglected the king himself. And he calls them to remember from where you were fallen. So what they were doing at first, they were doing really well, and they sort of fell away from that love. And he says, remember. Sometimes we need to remember the vision that God gave us. We need to remember where we were heading if we slightly go off track. He says, repent, do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And he concludes with those famous last words, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And that's a great promise for the overcomer. And it's interesting that this is the first church, because if we think about the first tree of life in the Garden of Eden, which Adam and Eve were supposed to be eating from, because he placed it in the midst of the garden with the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but they chose the wrong tree. They were supposed to eat of the other one. They were supposed to want life eternal with God. And we have this promise again as overcomers to eat of the right tree. We get that promise to go back and right what we should, what we should have done in the, in the very beginning. To eat the tree of life in the paradise of God, which I think is lovely. Yeah. So to be an overcomer, we can look at Ephesus and we can do all the things they were doing right and also not remember, and sorry, not forget to um, lose our first love. And we've got Smyrna next. Smyrna's from the word myrrh, and myrrh is associated with death. And Smyrna was a persecuted church. They were experiencing uh, lots and lots of, of martyrdom. They were afflicted, they had death, they had pressing trouble, they had poverty, they had abuse, they had slander. And Jesus, when he addresses this church, he says, I'm the one who was dead and has come alive again. He was giving them hope that death to the physical body is not the end. It's not the end with God. And actually with this church, he says, guys, you're only going through all this stuff, but there's worse to come. And he tells them that there's even more worse stuff to come. And to the world, these would look like these are being overcome because Rome's killing them. They, they're being killed for their faith. They don't look like overcomers from the outside. They look like they're being overcome. But Jesus says, no, you're rich. You are rich. You're rich in heavenly treasures. You're rich in heavenly rewards. You are doing everything you need to do. And there's no nevertheless, there's no but for this church. Everything's positive. He says, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Throughout these letters, we're going to see that Jesus wants us to have an eternal perspective. No matter what we're going through, even to the point of death, and remember, this applies across the whole church age. There are people here in, you know, in other parts of the world that are being persecuted for their faith, even killed for their faith, locked up for their faith. People are still experiencing this kind of thing now. And Jesus looks at that and he says, you're rich. The world may say you look like you're overcome, or I don't say you're overcome. And really, isn't it Jesus' opinion that's, that counts? Could we be faithful to the point of death? We can be overcomers by keeping our eyes on Jesus, and no matter what, holding fast like they did. The next three churches are really, they really deserve their own um, little in-depth study. Pergamos is the next one and the word gamos in, in Greek means marriage and it, on our sort of prophetic timeline if we're looking through the ages this is when the church became the state religion. Constantine uh, made Christianity the state religion and so persecution stopped pretty much. So they weren't experiencing what Smyrna were in our church calendar, in our overall history. And you'd think that would be really good. You would think they would then do everything that they were doing and do everything really well. And they were doing a few things well, because Jesus says he has something good to say. He says that even when somebody was martyred, a faithful servant, they held fast to his name. But he has a few things against this church. And when Jesus introduces himself, he, he says he's the one with the sharp, two-edged sword. So he introduces himself as the one judging with the word of God. And the problem in Pergamos is, well, they were clinging to the teachings of Balaam, and they were clinging to the teachings of the Nicolaitans, whom Jesus hates, which is a very strong word for Jesus. And he does use some quite strong words in these letters. But these teachings are not God's teachings. So Pergamos itself in that time was a centre for extreme idolatry. They had some temples there to force God. So they were a little bit, we could correlate them to Corinth. They were too accepting of um, false doctrines and immoral lifestyles. And they compromised the, world, the word of God to fit in with the world. When the church and the state unite, there is a compromise of the word of God. And Paul obviously tells us in Romans 12 to don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. We're supposed to look different to the world, not the same as the world. And Jesus is not overly impressed with that. He says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some hidden manna to eat. And that's the bread life. Jesus is the bread, isn't he? He says, I am the bread of life. We mustn't compromise our word of God, our bread of life that we're supposed to take daily for anything in the world. And I will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written on, which no one knows except him who receives it. These promises to the overcomer here are really, really personal. For the church that's sort of become united with the word, with the world, with this sort of an unholy union, He's promising something really personal, a new name written on a white stone. You know, when, when I got married, I took my husband's name. It's a very personal thing. He needs to remind us that we are betrothed to him. We should not be married to the world or the world's ways. So the overcomer will not conform to the world around us, to the ways of the world around us. It will renew their minds because we are God's set apart holy people. We are a chosen people. We are a peculiar people. I'm sure God put that in the Bible just for me. We <laughs> are very peculiar. <laughs> but those promises of hidden manna and a white stone and a new name, those are so beautiful. They speak to me of intimacy with Jesus. Thyatira is next, and it means sacrifice. So in our church timeline, prophetically, we're now up to like the medieval times. Um, and Jesus presents himself 
with eyes of flames of fire and feet like fine brass. That speaks of judgment. And these guys have a few good works. He says that he's seen their love, their faith, their service, their perseverance, and the later works that they've done were better than their first. So they've had some improvement, which is good. But they have a major problem. They tolerate Jezebel. It says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So they have allowed something in. They've allowed something in that's not the whole counsel of God. And if you remember Jezebel from 1 Kings, the wife of Ahab, very evil woman who wanted to um, infiltrate Israel with Baal worship, well, they part of their worship um, rituals was strange sexual rituals and infant sacrifice. Basically everything God opposes, they did. And that spirit of that has made its way into this church and they have tolerated it and they have allowed it to be taught. And it sometimes helps to just remember what was going on prophetically in that time as we were across the uh, church ages. In the medieval times, we lost access to the scriptures. They were all given to us by church leaders. We had new false doctrines. Salvation through works rather than grace came in. Worshipping images and dead saints became normal. Confession of sin to priests instead of God. That is a massive thing. That's taking God's place. The idea of purgatory, the idea of penance, corrupt church leaders, and there's a judgment pronounced for this for those who follow this, um, who don't repent, to be cast into the great tribulation. But he, Jesus, addresses a portion of people who haven't held to this doctrine. To the rest, he tells them to hold fast. He who overcomes and keeps my word until the end, I will give him power over the nations, he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So that famous, those famous last words, let him who has an ear, now comes right at the end of the letter. It's switched places. And Jesus promises power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. This is what Jesus will do in the millennium. We're told that he will rule the nations with a rod of iron in the millennium. So we have a, a reference to the millennium kingdom here. Jesus says to those who don't sacrifice themselves to this false teaching, but keep to God's ways, they have promised a place in the millennium kingdom. God wants us to know that we have a destiny that overtakes this world and goes on once we leave this mortal body. We have an eternal destiny. We have something that goes way beyond what we do here in this however many years we have on this earth. And he wants us to remember that we have not just things to do here on this earth, but we have things to do in the future as well, in his kingdom. And he promises them the morning star, and that's Jesus himself. So what must we do to overcome? He says that we have to hold fast. We have to resist that false teaching. We must hold fast to the things that the Bible says, not the things that the world says. And the world accepts many things as normal that God says isn't right. The world accepts many things um, like the killing of infants in a womb that God says is not right. And other things like... Um, the sexual immorality that the world practices, that God just says, that's not right, that's not my way. So we must keep ourselves pure to the world. In chapter 3 we get to Sardis. And this church, this word means escaping. And Jesus pretty much gets straight to the point because he doesn't have anything good to say about this church at all. And he gets straight to the bad. He says, you have a name, but you are dead. Which is quite shocking really and if you think about it if a person has died they are no longer a legal entity if a, if a, one of a married couple dies the, the marriage covenant 
ends. A person's bank accounts get frozen, they, they no longer have any of their previous legal obligations, they cease to be. Jesus says, look, you're calling yourself something, but there's no life. There's a dead faith here. And spiritually, there's nothing, he says, I've not found your works perfect before God or complete before God. So they'd started to escape something, maybe from what the previous church had, had set before them, but there's still much to do when he tells them to watch. Now when we, hear, when we see the word watch in the Bible, we often see it accompanied with pray, watch and pray. He says, watch, strengthen the things which do remain, the things that are on the verge of dying. Remember therefore how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. So there's very much a feeling that they're not holding fast to the word that they've received in their heart. We're told to welcome the word in our heart. We're told to nurture the word and to water the word. And it should grow. It's a seed. When we plant a seed, a seed grows. If it's not growing, it's not planted correctly. It's not in the right conditions. He says, hold fast and repent. Remember what you received. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. You will not know where I will, I will come upon you. And again, he's talking about his return. You have a few names in Sardis who even, sorry, who have not defiled their garments, for they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. I will not blot bless out his name from the book of life, for I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So he tells them to remember what they received and keep it and guard it and we very much need to remember that parable that Jesus told about the precious the precious um, pearl we must keep it and we must guard it and we must treat the word as something very precious and make sure that it grows and make sure that it's alive within us that our faith is alive there's no living faith in this church James talks a lot about faith without works is dead. That's not works to gain salvation because we're saved by grace. We could never do enough to earn our salvation. But when we are, when we are saved, when we have Jesus, we have new life on the inside of us and it should spring forth. Living things grow. Yeah. So the element of faith being dead is very much in contrast to the church everybody wants to be in, Philadelphia church where faith and love are alive and well and Jesus has nothing bad to say about this church. This is our missional church. These are the churches that sent out the, the missionaries across the world. Jesus presents himself as a holy true one and this church is, is being true to its, uh, its mission and its vision and everything that Jesus says to do. Jesus says you kept your commandment to per the commandment to persevere. You have little strength, but they kept his word and they didn't deny his name. So again, to the outside world, it may look like they're being a lot more overcome because it looks like they don't have very much strength. But Jesus says, no, I've got nothing bad to say. You're doing great. And he makes some amazing promises to the church of Philadelphia. He says he will make those of the synagogue of Satan to worship before the feet. For those of the synagogue of Satan to know that Jesus has loved them, to be kept from the hour of trial which shall come upon the world, the tribulation, he says to them, behold, I am coming quickly. And he says that they have a crown and to hold fast so no one can take it. So this church is an excellent example of an overcoming church. And remember, this is not bricks and mortar. This is an assembly of people who are doing what God's told them to do and are living a life of being an overcomer. To him who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He was an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's quite a mouthful, but that's a lot of promises and a lot of excellent promises. And this is the first uh, epistle that Jesus mentions his, his coming, the rapture, the tribulation, being saved from it, and the new Jerusalem. The, not just the millennium, but after the new heaven and the new earth. 
Overcomers not only have a place in the millennium, we also have a place in the new heaven and the new earth. We have a, an eternal destiny. And I've said that before, but Jesus seems to want us to know that we have an eternal destiny and it's good. So Jesus was well pleased with this church. And I don't think it's any coincidence that they're named Philadelphia, which means uh, brotherly love. Because Jesus said that by this all people will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. This church was living out its name. They were being the church of brotherly love. They were being what Jesus had envisioned for his church and that he wanted for his church. They were living a life of love. And we go from the church that does everything right to the church no one wants to be in, Laodicea. And on a prophetic timeline, this is unfortunately the 20th and 21st century church. Not that we are in this place, but in the prophetic timeline. This is the apostate church. Um, and remember, this is to the ecclesia, this is to all the body. And it, all of them apply to all of us right now. Laodicea comes from two Greek words meaning Leo, people, and Dicea, judge. The people rule or judge in this church. And because this is the last church, in the last time that Jesus specifically speaks to his churches like this, and if you've got a red letter Bible, if you go through the rest of Revelation, you will just see little pockets of red here and there. Um, a lot of it is just description of what John's writing down in his, in his um, dialogue with the angel. Um, and there's not actually a great deal more from Jesus. This, these whole two chapters are bright red. So this is the last time that Jesus is, is saying something to his church. And he says he's the amen, the faithful true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. He introduces himself as the faithful true witness to the church that isn't being a true witness. And he goes straight into it because he's got nothing good to say about them. And some of Jesus' most famous words um, are in this letter. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I mean, every time I read that, I just, I just get a little chill up my spine because I have to constantly examine myself, am I lukewarm? Am I lukewarm? I have to ask myself that because the thought of Jesus wanting to vomit me out of his mouth makes me very <laughs> emotional. Um, but that is what Jesus said. These are Jesus' words, not mine. He says, because you say, I'm rich, I've become wealthy, I have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. This is kind of the opposite of some of them other churches, especially if we look at Smyrna, who, you know, the world could look at them and think, well, they're not overcomers. This church were thinking, we're overcomers, we, we're okay, we're doing pretty well. But Jesus' assessment was, assessment was, no, you're not. You're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. So this church had a bit of a warped view of their spiritual state. Materially wealthy, spiritually bankrupt, I guess. So Jesus urges them, he says, buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with salve that you may see. And these are really hard verses to read. But, you know, we can't shy away from things that are in the Bible. The most beautiful verse comes next, though. <coughs> verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Mm -hmm. Now, even though this church, Jesus couldn't find one thing good to say about them, he still loves them and urges them to repent. And he says, look, because you're not on the right track, I'm going to have to rebuke you. You know, and, and that is not a bad thing from Jesus, to have him rebuke us sometimes, yeah. because it means he loves us. And he wants to put us on the right track because he so wants us to be an overcomer. He wants us to hear and he wants us to overcome and he wants us to have all these promises 
that he's put in his word. And these are some of the last words of Jesus. And the next verse is such a famous verse, and it's used in altar calls a lot when people are, you know, calling out the lost. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and eat with me. But we must remember in context, this is to the church. He's yeah. standing outside the church, knocking, hello, anyone hears my voice. You know, and it's great and we can use it for the, you know, for the lost. But we must remember that he does that to his church. Famous last words, these are the last ones he has uses to his churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Every step of the way, whether they're doing good or whether they're doing bad, Jesus wants us to overcome and he wants us to have the rewards that go with that. For those who are not doing so bad, he calls it out and he tells them. But for those who were doing good and doing nothing wrong, he still warns them, don't let anyone take your crown. Hold fast, because we're all just one step away from losing our first love, falling into a false doctrine or what, whatever, or becoming lukewarm. We all have to hold on to the word so, so tight that we have to nurture the word of God. And as I said, he's addressing the whole church and he's calling us out individually. Although he speaks to the church and the churches, and he does use the word churches, it's plural throughout, he always calls out individually. To him who has an ear, to the one who has an ear, the one who overcomes us right here personally. Individually, we all make up the body. We all have a part to play and we all have our own responsibilities. And I'm sure most of us live in a Philadelphian kind of church, loving each other, loving God, doing the things that he's asked us to do, sharing his word, nurturing his word, and not forsaking king, him, the king in, um, for kings of work. Jesus is vying for us all to be overcomers. So we all need to cling to these famous last words of Jesus. If we have an, have an ear, we have to hear. And I think we have to keep hearing. Because, you know, even if that first church, the apostolic church, can lose their first love and can fall in that way, so can we. We're not above those. We're no better than those. We're exactly the same. Jesus is talking to his church by his spirit in the present tense towards here and now. And I just want to finish with Jesus' very, very last words in Scripture, in uh, Revelation 22, verse 20. Surely I am coming quickly. And that promise of his coming is littered through these letters, reminding us that we have a blessed hope, reminding us that this is not all there is, reminding us that we have an eternal destination and he wants us to walk into eternity, having overcome in this world and going into the next with all of those wonderful blessings. Hallelujah.